Hello, my name's Paul Kurzweil. Uh, I'm Emeritus Professor of Social Linguistics from the University of, of York. And I'm going to be talking about something called Multicultural London English. Um, here's the out, outline of my talk here. We're going to start off with some preliminaries, first of all, where we, we discuss how, how the media got hold of this idea of Multicultural London English. Then we'll ask what's this, what's MLE, as it is for short, what's it like, who speaks it, what kind of linguistic features does it have, where did MLE come from, and then finally MLE, society, music and culture. Okay, so the media noticed a new accent back in 2006, the Daily Star. Um, initially, uh, MLE also went by the name Jafakan, and we'll, I'll sort of look again at that word. And then in the ensuing uh, 15 years or so, there was an increasing number of mentions in the British newspapers. So there were 87 between 2006 and 2012, uh, and then another 173 in, in, the next, uh, in the next nine years. So it's there very much and it's still there today. Okay, let's look, at, let's look to see what the Daily Star actually said. Okay. Regional, ac regional accents are being hijacked by a new kind of Ali G youth speak. Youngsters hanging around streets and playgrounds across Britain use a mix of Jamaican, West African and Indian to talk. And it's not just black kids who are, who are ditching Cockney, Brummy, Scouse and Mancunian dialects. Teachers have dubbed the phenomenon Jafakan. It's a language where sick actually means good and bitch is a girlfriend. London head Gary Phillips said, in the classroom, standard English is important because that's what they're marked for in exams. So just a comment on that slide. Uh, teachers certainly have not dubbed this, this phenomenon Jafakan. That's a media invention. And certainly there is a sort of, there's a, a tension between the use of any kind of non-standard accent or dialect and standard English in, in education. The London Evening Standard a few years later came up with this. We all speak Jafakan now in it. Cockney, one of the world's most famous dialects, will disappear within 30 years, according to reports this week. Harry Mount discovers what's replacing it on the streets of London. Even Professor Henry Higgins was rarely lost for words and, and would be dumbfounded. New research shows that the Cockney dialect he battled so hard to beat out of Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady will disappear from London streets within a generation. As its traditional speakers emigrate to Essex and Hertfordshire, the 650-year-old accent is dying off in London to be replaced by multicultural London English. Well, this accent, the Cockney accent, in its present form is not 650 years old, because then they're going back to Chaucer, so that's a, that's a bit of a strange statement. Um, but anyway, um, let's move on. So just what is multicultural London English then? Well, here is, is a, a definition by uh, Ruth Kircher and Sue Fox, who wrote an article recently. Emily is used to describe the speech of young people in multi-ethnic areas of London, regardless of the speaker's own ethnic background and their gender. A lot of young Londoners now use Emily instead of the Cockney dialect that's traditionally associated with London. So what does MLE sound like? We have uh, two uh, stars here, Big Zoo and Morrison, who, are, who work in the music industry. And it's a good idea to sort of, to listen for them to get an, an impression of MLE uh, on the web. So it's all sins, then I have to hold that. Do you know what I'm trying to say? But I feel like in my heart, my intention is pure. Yes, I do music to help my family and have fun and enjoy and not all my songs are just straight positive. Like some songs I'm saying, I'm going to do this to man and I'll do this to man and I'll punch man up and my boy's doing this and da -da -da, but it's because I'm reflecting on where I've come from. I'm not glorifying it. Yeah. Way back, that was like the one that, that, that video that was shot in the Ruthless Record shot was... SBTV. It was SBTV, you know. I was one of the first artists on there to do numbers kind of thing, like really, it's a big thing at the time, not because at the time it's the first time people see that I was wet. So it was the first time people heard my music, but they didn't know I was wet. And then Jamal brought that camera up 
I done that freestyle and then bang, wow, it's a big thing. His, his geezer's whack. His Morrison geezer's whack. Wow. Okay, so who speaks Emily and when? We see Emily is occupying a, a continuum from a vernacular variety through to a youth style. Okay, so what's a vernacular then? Well, a vernacular is a local dialect or accent. I think that's an everyday, uh, that's an everyday meaning, but it also means to linguists, the language that we grew up with. So this is a, so this, this, these are things we then need to think about. Speakers of MLE are usually from the inner city and it's likely to be their vernacular, so their everyday speech. Minority ethnic speakers use it more strongly, certainly, but it's not confined to minority ethnic speakers. Elements of MLE, especially slang, are available to other speakers, including people with more mi middle class backgrounds, perhaps, who live in the suburbs, as part of some kind of stylistic choice that they might, might make. OK, so what is MLE like? Well, we're going to look at vowels, first of all, and then we're going to look at the diphthongs in words, uh, goat, face, price and mouth. So in traditional Cockney, goat sounds something like this. Goat, goat, OK? In MLE, the same word is goat. And then for face, we have face. And for price, we have price. And for mouth, we have mouth. And, and I think you'll agree that these, these are different from the Cockney accent. Also, we have, in words like goose, we have an almost E-like vowel, sounding something like goose and then move. Not quite the same, but this is a feature that's actually quite common in the, in, in the south of England, but it's accentuated in MLE. For consonants, well, there's no more H dropping, okay? MLE speakers don't drop their H's, unlike the traditional Cockney dialect and, and, and in much of, of southern England. So they're, so they're saying things like, go home, my house. The people say, go home, my house. Okay, so different vowels here. TH fronting and TH stopping. Okay, what's this? So they sound th, the TH sound th. It's sometimes pronounced F so that we get thing. And this, of course, is true of many British English accents as, as well. Word initial the is often replaced with de, so that there comes out as dare. And this is a characteristic of MLE. Word initial th may also be replaced by t, but only in the word thing and in pronouns containing things. So words like uh, ting and something. And this is also something that we only find in MLE. K backing, this sounds exotic. So k is back to k before non-high back vowels. So where I say, and most people say car, cousin, college. MLE speakers say car, cousin, college. This sound is technically known as a uvula plosive. What about grammatical changes? There's a new pronoun, man. I'd like you to listen to it, first of all. I don't mind how my girl, I don't really mind how, how my girl looks. If she looks decent, yeah, and there's one bit of a face that just looks mashed, yeah. I don't care. It's a personality man's looking at. I'm not even looking at the girl proper like. Right, so what, what, what you can hear here is something like man being used as, as a pronoun, me, for instance, or, or I. But it can also be have a more of a general meaning, uh, so like you or one in, in other kinds of English. Let's look at some more changes. So the absence of two in motion expressions, like um, they, they go skating rinks instead of they go to skating rinks, or I used to go Stratford instead of I used to go to Stratford. And then there's Jamaican and African-American slangs, things like wagwan, ends, bruv, feds. OK, so I was part of uh, two projects that ran between 2004 to 2010, which was a sort of crucial time, really, for the, the emergence of, of MLE. So these are the two projects, the Linguistic Innovators Project uh, and the Multicultural London English Project. My co-researchers were Jenny Cheshire, Sue Fox, Aidan Togerson, and Arthan Khan, and the Economic and Social Research Council funded the projects. Okay, 
Um, the projects focus mostly on Hackney, though we looked at other, other boroughs as well. What kind of migration are we talking about then in places like Hackney? Uh, but in London generally, there was a big increase in immigration uh, from 1948, and this, they were the initial people who migrated came from the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica, followed by South Asia, so India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And then from the 1980s onwards, we get uh, quite large-scale migration from West Africa, Somalia, places like Kenya as well, Turkey, South America, North Africa. And then from 2004, there was the, the, the big immigration from Eastern Europe, notably Poland. But those people came, in a sense, too late to influence MLE as, as it was back in the early 2000s. Maybe they are influencing it right now. So, and then after World War II, from 1945 or so, there was a large scale outward migration of existing populations to new housing in surrounding counties. Okay, what are the, the dates of entry of uh, the West Indian, uh, Indian and Pakistani people? This graph shows the, uh, the number of people emigrating, Im immigrating to the UK at certain times. Uh, what you can see is that it's the it's the West Indians, the Caribbeans, who really got going, who, who got going first until around about um, in the in the early 60s, and then it was the Indians who, who took over as the majority, and of course Pakistanis and Bangladeshis were there as well. The graph doesn't actually show the the West Africans who came from from the 1980s or a little a little earlier. So it's quite a mix of people, as you can see. So what's the ethnic mix of Hackney today or in 2011? Well, you can see that 54% uh, were, were white, but amongst those 54%, approximately a quarter were not UK born. So they, they were from, from Europe and Ireland. The, the largest other group is the black group. That, that's divided evenly, I think, between uh, the Caribbean people and African people. So, who were the founders of London's youth culture and youth language? I think it's possible to argue that it was, in fact, the Jamaicans, the Caribbeans. In 1948, 802 migrants from the Caribbean colonies arrived in London on the Empire Windrush. You can see pictures of some young men on, on the left here. What about language? So what came before? MLE? What are the precursors of MLE? Well, we're thinking about the first immigrants now, the children of the first immigrants. We're talking circa 1960, I think, here now. So we have the white British who were there already, and they spoke Cockney, the London vernacular. An African Caribbean spoke Jamaican Creole, Patois, okay, which they had from their, from their parents, the first generation. And so they were, you know, like other immigrant groups, they would acquire the local language and they would also speak the language of, of their older generation as well. Then there's the rise of something that's been called London Jamaican, which came after this, the, the initial stage. This is a new youth language among young black people in the East End in the early 1970s. The criminologist and former social worker, John Pitts, has said that young, young black Londoners at first spoke with a Cockney accent, like the black footballer Ian Wright. And then in a few short years, they all sounded like Bob Marley, the Jamaican reggae artist. So there was a kind of shift from Cockney to something much more Jamaican in, in, the, in the 1970s. Mark Seber calls this London Jamaican. It wasn't used by white people particularly, and it was composed of a mix of Cockney and Jamaican Creole. And interestingly, it could be used by all black young people, regardless of where their ancestry was. What about the emergence of MLE? When did that start then? Well, our, our projects from 2004 to 10 were the first to actually note the existence of a new vernacular, very different from London Jamaican. Um, it was to a large extent ethnically neutral. So it could be spoken by people of, of different ethnicities, and indeed it still is. 
it was more stable than London Jamaican in that it wasn't a, a relatively unpredictable switching between Cockney and Creole. Okay, it had it had more stable features. We've already seen some of the linguistic features. The pronunciation features were probably the most striking ones. The thing that what what people notice, and it's quite different from Jamaican Creole, although it's sometimes mistaken for Jamaican today. We date its beginnings really uh, from the generation born in the mid 1970s, so a few years after London Jamaican. And as for the label Multicultural London English, well, we gave gave it that label in 2006. And that brings us back to when, when the media started talking about it. So what languages have influenced Multicultural London English? Well, certainly Caribbean Creoles and ex-colonial Englishes from Africa. So Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Kenya places like that. Indian English um, and, and Caribbean English as well. Learner varieties of English, so people who are learning to speak English. So this would be the, uh, be the parents, the initial immigrants, who would then be acquiring English. Um, and then we have the local London dialect, Cockney, of course. And then varieties encountered in the schools so of standard English in the written form and the spoken form as well. And uh, teachers varieties, not all of which would be, would be standard English. And many of the teachers would have regional accents as well. And then the media. Well, initially television, but later on YouTube, Inst Instagram and popular music. And popular music is something I'm going to be talking about. Importantly, monolingual speakers have also been exposed to these varieties. So MLE is therefore shared across ethnic and language backgrounds because it's, you know, it's the, this way of speaking is in in the air so to speak and uh east london is is quite mixed it's not uh, that you know that, that there aren't uh, it, it isn't as if speakers of one particular language all gather together in one place not to a great extent anyway um so it's a bit so it's a it's a bit of a melting pot of course even so there are still ethnic differences and then round about the year 2000 maybe 2002, something like that, Emily goes mainstream in film and TV. And here's just a brief list of films and shows uh, which, which use this, this way of speaking, kid adulthood, adulthood, black sheep, another hood, attack the block, top boy, phone shop. So Emily is, it's not named as such, but the accent forms part of the, of the characterization. Or, uh, in the film. Main, Emily is mainstream culture. Um, I can cite two performance poets here. One, George the Poet, uh, who, whose ancestry is from Uganda. His parents were from Uganda. And he is a rapper, but he's also a social commentator. Uh, he, he, um, he, he has these performances on, on TV and on, on YouTube, the radio, where he does the social commentary in, 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 in poetry. So he's something of an, I mean, surprisingly enough, he's something of an establishment figure now, and he's in his 30s. Much more recently, we have Giovanni Rose, who is a 17-year-old from South London, Tottenham, who won a, a youth poetry prize for his, uh, poet, for his poem called Welcome to Tottenham, which he performed, which you can, you can watch on, on, the, on the BBC website here. So the, these are part of the sort of, um, the, the use of this language as part of the performance and making it visible, it's highly visible now. What about music? Well, here we're dealing with British hip hop grime. Um, Emily has been strongly associated with grime music since the beginning, really, of, uh, of grime. Dizzy Rascal's Boy in the Corner really was the first major hit, by him at least, and then uh, Stormzy shut up in 2015. So their language is multicultural London English, and it's very much that in pronunciation. In grammar, they, they make use of the pronoun man quite frequently. 
Um, and there's there's another song, uh, Man's Not Hot by Big Shack, which I think shows that. And then the word man is then adopted by uh, young people everywhere these days. So in terms of slang and other vocabulary, well, it's, as I said, it's mainly Jamaican and African-American. And here we have some of the same ones. Um, Ends, Wagwan, uh, Yadi, Batiman. Then we have Mandem, Gyaldem, Boydem. That's an interesting because the dem bit on these words is a Jamaican Creole way of forming the plural. So there's, a, there's man and then there's mandem. There's girl, girldem, boy and boydem in Creole. And that's very much part of MLE today and brethren as well. Now, interestingly, this is not unique to Britain. Across Europe, urban contact dialects or multi ethnolects as we like to call them, are associated with with hip hop. So the other in in other European cities, especially Northwest Europe, we find very similar things going on. There's a link between Emily Grime and the Black Experience, and this is then symbolised by uh, some publications by Jeffrey Boache, who is by now a well-known broadcaster. Um, the, the two books here: Hold Tight. Black Masculinity, Millennials and the Meaning of Grime, and Black Listed. A DJ calling himself DJ Target, aka Darren Joseph, wrote a book called Grime Kids. And then the, the broadcaster Efua uh, Hirsch wrote a book called Brit-ish. And in that she reflects on, on her experience as a, as a mixed race uh, Brit. But she also mentions MLE by name in the book. And she says that this is the language of inner city youth and grime music. She's not part of it because she's middle class and from, and from West London. Um, but she makes it very clear that this is, is something to be associated with, with London and, uh, and music. Finally, I'll mention a, uh, a, a book of poems by um, uh, Caleb Femi, whose origins were in, in Nigeria. Um, poor, it's called. And this is from a review of Caleb Femi's Poor by Dan Williams. And this is interesting because Dan Williams mentions MLE. I sat and read each poem at least twice. The use of MLE, multicultural London English, made me feel like I was talking to old school friends, forming a safe space to chat about anything that crosses our minds. All this being said, for those who aren't as versed in MLE, this book and its language is a window into a world that you may only know of from those negative stereotypes media companies feed off. Okay, some, some conclusions now. Well, Emily is the most recent in a line of youth styles in London and elsewhere. It's the vernacular for many young people, and now, by now some older people as well. It's the result of contact between different peoples and different languages. It's non-ethnic at heart and has become an emblem of modern youth. Slang, the slang is Jamaican or African-American and interestingly is not from Africa or the Indian subcontinent. It's strongly espoused by London-based black culture, poetry, literature and above all music that we've seen so far. And then finally, uh, here are a couple of resources that, that might, might interest listeners. Um, there's my, my own uh, Multicultural London English page, University of York, and then the uh, Jenny, Jenny Cheshire and Sue Fox's uh, Queen Mary University of London site called uh, Teach Real English contains a lot, a, a lot of recordings and is, is very much worthwhile. Thank you.